but let's now spin the globe and go to Africa. Um, and it just gives me great pleasure to introduce um, two fantastic women <laughs> uh, colleagues, uh, Colleen Vogel and Gina Zierbogel. So Colleen is a distinguished professor at the Global Change Institute at the University of Watersland in, excuse my pronunciation, in Johannesburg, South Africa. And for decades, she's been a leader in research in climate change, climate vulnerability and adaptation with a particular focus on disaster risk reduction and climate variability. Gina Zierwogel is an associate professor at the Department of Environmental and Geographical Science at the University of Cape Town in Cape Town, South Africa. Her research focuses on issues related to development in a, to development in a context of climate change, including municipal adaptation strategies, adaptation governance, institutional barriers and enablers to adaptation. Uh, that there's some, I think, great resonances with what Leonard was talking about, this transferability of, of successful adaptations um, and transdisciplinary processes for urban transformation. Uh, so welcome to the web webinar series. Thank you so much. And I, who's going to speak first? Um, I think I am, but Gina's oh. going to load our slides, I think. All right. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jean. Right. We're just going to go to slide share mode, I think. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you very, very much for this wonderful chance to be with you all, and in particular to see many colleagues, <laughs> and also to have a chance to write into the book and to honor um, all the foot soldiers that have been before us and are currently still marching on on climate change. Um, it's interesting when you showed the review of who's participating, I don't think I saw anyone from Africa, but that could be because we're celebrating Africa Day today. <laughs> we celebrate the creation of the African Union, so maybe people are out celebrating, <laughs> or it could be because they load shed, uh, which is what is happening in our part of the world, and they just can't get onto the, the Zoom, or maybe they just know it all and um, don't need to listen to some old fogies or young people talking about these issues. But anyway, we want to talk about climate change. We were asked to talk about climate change in the African context. And as you can see there, we can choose to make a difference uh, we, if we do substantial mitigation or if we don't do substantial mitigation. And you can see the African region in particular, the Southern African region has become known as a hotspot. So we have a lot to deal with, not only increased temperatures, but also increased incidences of flooding. We've seen that happening now recently, unfortunately, with a huge loss of life in, case, uh, in the KwaZulu-Natal area, which is to the east and south of the country. Next slide, please, Gina. So what we wanted to do in the chapter was to try and give you a sense from the audiences, the stakeholders, I don't like to use the word stakeholders, but the actors who are actually facing these challenges and in particular will face them in the future. And so what we wanted to do was to, if you like, embed the discussion in urbanization, but then to look at who will be facing this going forward. And many of us are very fortunate to be working with cohorts of young people, and I use the word with, not for. And what happens in the work that we're doing, as you'll see in both the presentation that I'll make and also that Gina will be making, is that context really matters. Local knowledge counts, youth-informed knowledge counts, and community-based knowledge really counts. And if you can go to the next slide, please, Gina. So as we know, um, the figures are, are really growing for Africa in terms of the proportions living in informality or slum areas. Uh, the projections are also that these will be increasing with many, many people coming in to try and find livelihoods and to try and actually have good lives, if you like. And, and author Abdu Malik Simon, I think, expresses it so beautifully. He says cities are densities of stories, passions, hurts, revenge, aspiration, avoidance and complexity. And what I think we want to try and share in this presentation is that it may be that we cannot any longer just reduce this multiple complexity into uniform or simple codes 
Act or codification. And so I think we're struggling with kind of traditional policy making and planning and these complex sets of lived stories, lived experiences and lived lives. And by working with different actors, you get a much, much more, I think, nuanced picture of what's going on in these very interesting complex cities. And then how do we adapt from those going forward? Next slide. So I have been turning to the youth, maybe because I'm getting long in the tooth and the youth inspire me. So it keeps me fresh and young. And I've been very fortunate to be working with a range of youth cohorts, both um, in Johannesburg and in South Africa, and then across into Africa itself. And in fact, delegations going to the COPs where they're not just on the streets with the greater Thunbergs of the world, but actually are making influential decisions and influencing policymakers and writing into policy. So that's the theme I want to um, cover today. And then I'll hand over to Gina. Next slide. So as I indicated, I have embarked on a journey with the city of Johannesburg, working on climate change adaptation for the last six years. They were asked us to help them with their adaptation planning. But what was really interesting was the bonus, if you like, that came out of that work. So I had built up, as we all do, if we work with cities, Gina has done the same and others I'm sure in the audience have also done the same. You build up a long trust trying to get ideas, dialoguing, sharing, working on joint visions for cities going forward in these very complex situations. And what came out as a benefit was being able to engage with these youth cohorts that were already growing and very active and vibrant all across South Africa, but actually being enabled to link them directly to the city. And then COVID happened. So the face-to-face -face wasn't enabled, but the city came with the youth. We had weekend sessions where the city officials actually gave up their Saturday mornings, as did the youth. And there was a co-designed process of trying to jointly get the youth voice of what their adaptation planning is going forward. So not just you know, the older generation and the previous generation's ideas. And so this was really exciting. The youth took it on really, really seriously. They worked many, many evenings by themselves. And the principles that they came up with, I think are really interesting. And this is through the gaze or the eyes of the youth. The one was intersectionality, that it's very difficult to now unpack what is really driving some of the impacts of climate change because of the intersectionality, issues of justice, issues of who gets access, who gets say, who gets power, et cetera, et cetera. The systematic changes that are occurring, trying to ask cities to see this as a complex system and not just deal with things in sectors and silos, community focus, the whole issue of the just transition, accessibility and sustainability, et cetera. These were what the youth put forward and what they have then asked to take forward into the policy planning space. Next slide. Unfortunately for Johannesburg, and I think in some cases, many African cases, but in particular in Johannesburg, we've had a number of mayoral switches or shifts. Some of our mayors unfortunately have been passing away um, quite a few of them in the last uh, few years. But what was really fortunate at the time was that the mayor of the, the time when this was being written, it was launched last year, he and his uh, cohorts of the bureaucracy in the city were so impressed with what the youth were doing that he invited the youth to actually write into the document themselves, not asking me as the professor to translate into the document, but actually write in. And so this is the forward from the youth. And I just want to read it very quickly because I think it's one of the first cases I've seen where the youth voice is actually in written into a document as opposed to being brokered into a document. We are in a situation of urgency, severity and scope never before faced by humankind. So far our response isn't anywhere close to adequate, but you already know that. You know it in your gut, in your bones. We are each part of the planet's living systems knitted together with almost 7.7 .7 billion human beings and 1.8 million known species. We can feel the connections between us. We can feel the brokenness and the closing window to heal it. This earth, our home, is telling us that a better way of being must emerge and fast. The science is clear. According to the IPCC, we need to limit the rise in global temperature to 1.5 by 2030. We are already experiencing the effects of climate change with vulnerable communities experiencing the effects, experiencing the effects more severely. The time to act is now. So that was the, the forward that was 
in the document asked by the youth to put it right up front. So it was a wonderful opportunity. Um, next slide, please. So they also then wrote into the actual plan and unpacked many of those principles um, that you have seen. And they then wrote a national plan, which was presented to the government departments that was handed over at the end of last year. So there's a Johannesburg plan for climate adaptation and there's a national plan. And now they're mobilizing with an African plan. But what we wanted to do, much like Leonard suggested in his talk as well, is what are we learning? What have we learned from this community um, and particularly the youth adaptation um, experiences. And I just want to leave these for you because I think it goes back to the opening quote that I made from Abdu Malik Siman about the complexity of stories. What the youth suggested is in going forward in curriculum is not so much only the hard science, which we need, and obviously that's undeniable, we need those hard skills, but also the soft skills, open communication, critical and creative thinking, empathy, listening, patience, et cetera. So the youth have actually started to open up. They're starting to influence our curricula, but more critically, they are now involved in the implementation of some of these adaptation plans in the city of Johannesburg and elsewhere in South Africa. And I'm really excited to be part of some of that work. So thank you. And I now hand over to Gina to expand on some of the stories that she's um, encountered and been sharing and enabling in her work. Thank you. Great, thanks, Colleen. I'm not sure what happened there. Let's go back to screen share. Great. So, yeah, really to pick up on what um, has come before and to say hello to everybody. Um, so one of the things we're really trying to get across here is that if we do want to try and um, focus on adaptation, building resilience, we can't actually just focus on one um, approach. There's no individual who knows what the best approach is. So we have to understand that there are multiple perspectives and multiple ways of seeing the problem. And the more we embrace that, the more likely we are to be able to deal with this complex uh, change. And so we need to draw on multiple perspectives. And government is one actor in this, but we really need to um, bring in some of the actors who have not been central to some of the decision making before. And for those of us like Colleen and myself, that includes some of the voices who have been more marginalized, such as the youth, such as um, low income communities. And we've seen this growing push towards social justice, which many of us support. And if that is part of our um, rationale, we really need to listen to those who are bearing the brunt of climate change impact. So I want to talk briefly about one project that I've been involved in that um, comes through in the chapter and the slides quite clearly. And then I want to spend the second half um, showing you a video of some new work um, that I've been doing. So the FLOW project, Fostering Local Wellbeing, really was um, working with the youth where we wanted to focus on a transdisciplinary research um, and action project thinking both about um, what it means to be socially just and ecologically sound. And we were working in two small towns um, in South Africa. Um, and this town here in the Western Cape was called Paketburg, um, a few hours from Cape Town. And so the youth um, became these ambassadors and they were part of this program that had a whole number of components. One was developing a community currency um, we were also working very closely with the uh, local municipality who, again, um, similar to Colleen's story, were actively engaging with the youth and quite inspired by this because there has been a history of separating um, municipal and government um, interventions from the people, which um, for many of us doesn't really make sense, um, but needs to shift because often the government officials feel quite vulnerable when they um, open up. And in this case, they really were quite inspired by the in innovative um, approaches that the youth brought. So um, I just wanted to share the um, way we were thinking about transformative capacity in, as a way to build uh, change, where we were thinking about personal agency um, and self-determination, social cohesion between and within groups. And so this we really saw within the youth, different youth from across the town, and then between the youth and the municipal officials, it was wonderful to see how that social cohesion increased. 
And then what we called awareness of and connection to life support systems. And we really saw life support systems as both the um, environmental resources, water, food, soil, et cetera, and also financial systems as underpinning uh, well-being. And so we were really working towards transforming to a youth that was part of an engaged civil society, local government that were a partner state that wanted to partner, an informal business that was taking on an ethical business approach. And for us, that was the kind of aspirations of transformation that we were working towards. And so there's not time to go into many of the details of what they did, but there were many learning activities. And part of what we were doing is helping the youth to really embed themselves in understanding what it meant to see the system as a whole. So they would look at their house holds and understand resource flows, resource use. They looked at municipal services um, and went to visit some of those and um, filmed them. And so that is the part that I want to sort of wrap up with on the flow project is that linking to what Colleen started with, telling stories can be so powerful. So one of the things that they did as um, the youth ambassadors was becoming mobile journalists. And they had a whole course on how to make these short documentaries, use video um, through active citizenry to share stories about what was happening locally, what was happening with the elderly, what was happening with the youth, what was happening with municipal service and show some of these videos, both um, in kind of public spaces uh, that the municipality was holding, but also amongst the youth. And that was really exciting. And so here is the book that emerged out of this project. Um, and you can see the link over there. And I really encourage you to look at it. We got a journalist to work on it. We got beautiful photos. And there is a tab there saying watch where you can see some of these stories. And so the um, municipal manager who was working on this project uh, was really central to this and through her support it was able to actually continue and it continued without our university support and so that for us was a really strong indicator of sustainability that the municipality took it forward and found funds to um, carry on this project. And as she said, I've been doing social development for 20 years, and I can tell you this is the first program I've seen that can really constitute well-being in a community. And it just links to much of the work that many of us have been doing, that addressing the root causes of vulnerability is so central to climate adaptation. Yes, we can have um, specific adaptation, but we also need to have this more um, kind of... Colleen, could you turn off your sound? Sorry. Oh, sorry. And so the second point that I really want to make is around community generated data. And so we heard a question earlier for Leonard about citizen science, and that's really important. And we've heard how the youth have shared their voice and their stories. But another um, area that I feel very passionate about when trying to bring in these perspectives is community generated data. We've seen a tendency for cities and local governments to have the type of data that they can collect um, that's often quantitative, that often comes from a way of thinking of what services can the city provide. But increasingly, we need to understand what is the data that can be shared from a bottom-up perspective, because that can really inform response um, and help us to understand the lived reality that people are facing when it comes both to experiencing the impacts of climate change and understanding some of the ways um, that we can adapt across scales. And so I've had a project for the last five years in Cape Town looking at urban water governance for resilience. And I worked a lot on the uh, drought and understanding some of the governance of the droughts and uh, sharing those lessons learned and um, Again, here's a lovely book also with some um, pictures and worked with a journalist to share that story. But emerging from that, I really felt the need to work with local NGOs around capturing their story. And so the last bit's going to be an eight minute film where you're going to um, enjoy the benefits of the arts and filmmaking to see the story of um, the people we've worked with and how they have really gathered data about water issues in their community to try and um, inform the local government on how we can address some of these issues.
as Bassas or Bana, water is life. Mm. Without water, I can't do no answer. Quabonaga Loko Bana, a man's Gufnega Swanaka, Swanaka, Keleka, cool and Ayapela, a man's a Western Cape, Quabonaga Lokoti. Ula poku vele kona ukuba onga tatindweni atake kakulu koko kona yo indonoko epokotini ukuba galuku. Sense Maker Project is part of a bigger piece of work that I've been doing. I was very interested in addressing issues of adaptation to climate change in cities. And for me, a lot of the adaptation to climate change is experienced through a water lens, both through drought and flooding. I'm also particularly interested in what it means in cities in Southern Africa. And so issues of inequality are very important to address. And of course, people have very unequal access to water services, to uh, resources to adapt to climate extremes. I got involved in this project because I was interested in the water crisis in Cape Town. I also knew from even be from before getting here that there's a broader story to be told as well, um, where not everyone is facing the same type of crisis. So one of the important principles for me when thinking about resilience of cities to climate and water stress is the importance of bringing in multiple voices and understanding the different perspectives and stories of how we might try and respond to the challenges. The Environmental Monitoring Group, which is based in Cape Town, really its projects are to facilitate a respectable or a respectful relationship between people themselves and the environment. We also believe that power needs to be questioned and disrupted so that it responds fairly, not speaking on behalf of communities, but creating spaces where those in power come to communities and the conversation happen. So basically, the whole process had two steps. The first steps was designing the data collection and then going out and collecting stories. And then the second half of the project was the second workshop, analyzing the data and synthesizing the insights, and then going out and also then sharing the insights and, uh, and feeding back stories to the communities where we had studied. Johan and Gina came and we had workshops with him. And then we started with a sense maker. They educate us around that. And we had classes at Stellenbosch University. One of the things that came out of the Water Caucus was that they wanted to learn tools to document their experience because they have stories to tell of their own experience, but they haven't necessarily been trained in research or collecting data. And so they saw that as something important. It was a learning process. And yeah, there was also painful moments because when you go out there to do the research, and you see the problems of the people. As you walk by now, you tear tanum to you make the cell go walk by and jingle up in my cars. We and as most numbed in a limiter box on Ayo, eating you and Ayako into at home to a vole is for Bassa Kuba Bomba, um, the better way in now. I'm not a tete. It was not Stellenbosch or UCT sharing its findings. With the, with, with the officials. It was ordinary people that had been doing the research on the ground and sharing their findings with the, with the officials. Officials begin to realize that it, people can be able to do this. And then they are pre presenting something with facts, tested, inform, tested data on the ground. Uh, they are presenting to us. Therefore, I think their perception about community I think it has changed. The city says, yes, we want to engage with NGOs and citizens, but how do we engage one-on-one? -on -one? So if NGOs can come with data that is what they see as robust, then 
they are likely to be interested. And we saw that that was the case. So at the end of SenseMaker, the city officials who um, were present at that workshop were really interested in this data. I think our team from the city were so impressed by the way that, that ordinary people had presented so professionally um, the information that they had researched and provided. Um, I think it was a very empowering exercise for, for many of the community members. And it really shone through the dedication, really the kind of the good work that they'd done with the academic partners. It was very impressive to see. What the, the findings also did was that it really created a, a platform for the city and the community organization to have a dialogue. And when you have a set of data that you can discuss as equals, it created a re really different atmosphere and more collaborative environment. And that was really cool to see. We're trying to understand how citizens experience the water system and how they can best adapt to the water system, whether it's droughts or flooding or service delivery, which is part of the bigger water system. And if you've got your service delivery right, then during droughts and floods, there's less impact on individual households. This is an unusual situation because usually what happens, the research has come from institutions of high learning and come and gather information and present that information to officials and other academics. Now it's ordinary people on the ground gathering this evidence and data on the ground in collaboration with the institution of high learning and discipline and presenting to officials. This proves that knowledge is not only possessed by a certain sector of the society, Do you have um, do you have hope for the relationship with the city that it could become better from here on out? Do you have any hope? <laughs> there is hope, yes. Yes, there is hope. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gina. Want to just say a, a few words of uh, a wrap up for for the for your part? Or, I don't think what? It speaks for itself. It does. That's true. It's wonderful. Wow. Um, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, really wonderful and and important and meaningful presentations and contributions to the book and um, and to the webinar series. So, Jen, over to you for I think there are a few questions in the chat mostly i think all right so let's see here um so maxine lovner is asking um if you could give examples of citizens research on water um i'm not sure exactly what the question means yeah but if, i was also <laughs> if, if Mac, maxine if you want to expand yeah, and, and put an, more of your question in the chat or in the q a box um and then we can maybe, go back to that one but maybe i can just say that in terms of the um ngo um people that i worked with the kinds of things that they were particularly interested in and challenged with are a few things. First of all, um, a lot of households have water management devices, which are water meters that stop the flow of water after a certain amount, 350 liters a day. Um, and so then that's supposed to be water that you don't pay for, but they're still getting billed. So there were a lot of challenges around billing, a lot of challenges around water management devices. Sewage is an issue and sewage and poor sanitation, poor drainage. You saw some of the photos in that video um, where there's really a lot of issues with that. 
Um, they have problems engaging with the city when they're trying to figure out these problems. Who do they go to? They get sent from one to another to another. They then try and figure out and they can't find out who to speak to. So then they get their own plumber, which is illegal, but the city doesn't come to these low income areas to help them with a leak. And so they have no water, so they need to make a plan. But so these are some of the challenges that um, these NGOs are working with. Okay, and then uh, from Joel Smith, we have, can you comment on how the legacy of apartheid is affecting adaptation in South Africa? Mm. Colleen, do you want to start? <laughs> sure. Um, I think, Joel, that's, you know, um, a very critical question. And I think the creation of the inform informal places where many of the marginal now live are obviously huge uh, legacies from the past. Um, there has been a lot of, you know, effort by the current government to make up for those deficits and for those legacies. But I think a lot of what we're seeing now is how the hazards, in particular the flooding and drought events, are just unveiling um, what we've had in the past. But I think Gina would agree that unfortunately, Currently, our governance systems, not only government systems, are not really working up to the level that is needed. And they're acknowledging that. In fact, the president admitted to that um, last week about the, the problems that have been happening in Natal, et cetera. So, I mean, it's the kind of the traditional approach, right? That when these events happen, it unveils these vulnerabilities that have always been there from structural drivers of change. And so that historical legacy is there, but I think what both Gina's presentation and the one that I was sharing with the youth that I'm engaged in, what's so powerful is that people are taking agency. They are not waiting necessarily for government to do it all. We don't want the state to roll back and have everybody having to do what they should be doing anyway. But I think there is a renewed sense that the, the local communities are now taking their own agency and then where they're finding these leverage points to work with people who are um, enabling them to come into the presence, if you like, of government and put their cases on the table. But the biggest problem, Joel, is always going to be the accountability issues. Uh, you know, who holds government and state accountable? So I, that's what I would say. I mean, it's a huge problem that's ongoing, uh, but I think there is a renewed sense that we have to, you know, really now start working collectively um, to turn the corner. And I think some are, as you've, I think, seen in the presentations we've done today. Thanks. Gina? Looks like Joel's had to leave, but I just wanted to say that um, spatial planning, I think, you know, when we see how cities are structured today, and I guess this is for many of you on this call, you see a legacy of the historical planning, and it's so hard to overcome that. So in South Africa, you know, um, there are many people who battle to move into cities, who try to move in are on marginal land, flooded land that floods easily, poor quality soil, all those things. And it's very hard then to shift some of that exposure and um, sensitivity to risk. And maybe if I can just follow on from that, I think what some of the urbanists, people like Edgar Peterson, Sue Parnell and others who we work with are fortunate to engage with, what many are saying is that trying to normatively just reduce everything into kind of uh, traditional planning modules or kind of codifying um, in these complex informalities isn't maybe going to be the only way to go forward. And so that's the interesting tension that we have to work with. How do we make and use these stories in a way that can be effective for the kind of transformation adaptation that we need both now and in the years to come. So it's a really interesting set of um, issues. But there are, thank goodness, lots of also very good urbanists that Gina and I are fortunate to work with who are helping us to get a sense of some of that. And I'm sure in the rest of Africa as well. And maybe to follow up, I mean, I think it speaks to, you know, work that's happening on southern cities and this notion that we can't just cookie cut any of these responses. So there's lots of adaptation experience happening internationally. How do you draw from that? 
while making stuff your own. As Colleen said, the, you, know, you can't just roll out things. And there's a lot of innovation happening, but equally there's a sense of urgency and this need for service delivery, but to do it in a sustainable way that doesn't undermine resources, that doesn't undermine people who can't access them. So yeah, I think it's a really exciting time for adaptation to climate change. We've got a lot of opportunities. Um, but unfortunately, I'm seeing insufficient attention to kind of the inequality issues. In theory, there's so much people are talking about climate justice, etc. But a lot of cities are trying to get in money to kind of secure the services of the city. And in doing so, then the um, low income groups are not getting their needs met. So it really is um, a challenge that cities are trying to face. Thank you. Okay, so next question from Alex Desherbenin asks, um, is youth action most effective at the local level or are there other levels, example, at national or even international levels where youth voices are being heard and changing policies or programs? I'm thinking of within Africa, not so much international youth climate movements. Yeah, so Alex, if I can come in there, that's um, what I was trying to share, but obviously had limited time. So the youth are very connected. It's, it's quite interesting. They're not working in isolated pockets. So whoever's working on these, this work, either in Cape Town, Western Cape, or in the case in Johannesburg, they connected across the country and then they connect with the African groups, et cetera. And they go forward into the COPs um, as their own networks and blocks. And um, they're very, very well coordinated. So there is a, it's not, you know, just a sense of youth coming together for the sake of youth coming together. There's a deliberative planning uh, set of work that's going on. If you go to the South African Institute of International Affairs, you'll be able to see all the different committees they have. They work on gender, you know, food security, et cetera. And then they connect to people um, working in communities like where Gina's working in Western Cape, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's a very deliberative strategy and it's quite amazing. Um, and I say this from myself because in some ways I wish I could be young again and connect with such lively groups, but definitely they're organized, they're mobilized, they're presenting documents to uh, uh, parliament, to municipal officials, to national government officials. So in the case of Johannesburg, they wrote into the local policy, then they reorganized themselves and redid a whole process and then presented that to Barbara Creasy, who's the Minister of the Environment. So that went forward, then they went forward into the African Caucasus, and then they went forward into the COPs in Glasgow and started to try and embed some of this. So it's, it's, it's really fascinating to see what, what's going on. And it's, it's a wonderful experience being part of this. And I think the point that Gina is also making is that, you know, one of the points when I was working with the city um, of Johannesburg, they said, gee, Professor, you know, well done for writing such a nice forward and all that stuff that we're going to put into our adaptation plan. And I said, it's not mine. It's not my voice at all, it's the voices of the youth. And like Gina was showing, it's the voices of the people that um, she and her team were engaging in. And I think that's a very different and much more emotionally, I think, empowering way of moving people along into this group. And the youth are not holding back. They kind of, you know, we're moving forward. We're not waiting for some, you know, smoke to come out of some chimney somewhere to condone what we're doing. Thank you. And, and I actually have a kind of a follow up question to what you were just saying in, in that what do you think are the biggest barriers uh, that these youth are facing um, through this process? Um, I'll come in quickly and then I think Gina must, you know, also have points, obviously. I, I think the biggest fight that the youth have faced is being tokenistically treated. So one of the biggest barriers now is that they've been knocking on the door and now the door's open. Now people are saying, okay, come in and tell us what to do. Let's make you the real ambassadors in the local government system and, you know, let's do work together. And suddenly I think, you know, the youth are suddenly saying, oh my gosh, now's our moment. So I think some of the barriers that I'm finding is that sense of the urgency now that they have to really now step up. And also in the case where I'm working a lot of, of the youth that I'm engaging with want more knowledge. They want it quicker. And that goes back to Joel's question. There's this deficit of, of quite a weak education system that hasn't necessarily prepared 
many of the young people, but there's obviously now agency, they're going forward, they're learning, they're hungry, they're organizing themselves often without pay in informal settlements to create these clusters. So I think there are the barriers, but they're also in an interesting way becoming opportunities. And there's a big program at the moment where we're trying to dovetail now some of this youth action with Um, Colleen, you just hit mute, I think, by mistake. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so there's a big program developing with Rhodes colleagues where they're trying to work with the National Treasury on big labor um, approaches. So there are the challenges, but I think there's also a range of opportunities. Gina? Yeah, I think also there's a shift in worldviews where, you know, many of the youth are seeing this connected nature in a way that um, many of the older ones among us aren't. So there's a lot of frustration with how um, issues are being treated in silos. Um, so I think that's been frustrating. And then, yeah, I think it's interesting to see South Africa, Colleen mentioned the phrase just transition in her slides. And there's a big focus now in South Africa on moving away from coal. What are the employment opportunities? How can we have uh, clean energy, how can there be employment opportunities, and employment is a big concern um, for the youth, and yes, many of them are being innovative and entrepreneurs, but finding the support for this is sometimes hard, I think, um, and maybe linked to the new question from Alex in terms of uh, moving from rural areas to urban areas is really this idea of opportunity of hope of a better education system, more employment opportunities, more chances to be connected, but many people moving to urban areas often have a worse quality of life when they move, uh, are moving to quite poor um, housing. They're often quite far out of town, uh, battle to get um, income when they do, that's spent on transport and food. So um, yeah, a lot of challenges at the moment um, in our country on that. Thank you. Um, so if there are any other questions then we can uh, transition to our discussion. Um, and let me just pass it off to David. So the topic now is where are we going next as far as impacts and adaptation is concerned. Leonard actually had a slide about that for the Caribbean. And if you noticed, a key point in his slide was the issue of livelihood. And we all know from our own and personal, personal and other experience that uh, getting people's self-interest involved is a sure way to try to get anything to happen. We also saw in the talks on South Africa that where self-interest is involved, it's very often that the most vulnerable are the least accessible to, to uh, solutions and power that will actually help them. So if indeed that is the human nature of things, how do we go forward in getting people's self-interest involved in both appreciating the potential impacts of climate change and also uh, helping their livelihood, helping, helping them live better lives, whether it be in cities uh, or in other areas. You know, in North America, the problem is that while people recognize that climate change is an issue, often, or at least part of the population, feels that it's not in their self-interest to do anything as far as mitigation goes. And even, even adaptation has a lot of inertia associated with it. So anyway, uh, Leonard, uh, Colleen, um, uh, Gina, anybody who wants to address how, how are we going to go forward in an efficacious way to accelerate what was, is likely going to be and accelerate solutions to what's likely going to be an accelerating problem? Yeah, well, let me, if I can jump in here. Um, I think that, it's not only new things we have to do. I think we have to do some of the old things better. And one of the things that I think is becoming more effective in the Caribbean is the need to show direct linkages between 
the science, the policy, and livelihoods. And you, I think you rightly made the point that until people actually see that direct linkage on their own life, sometimes at the personal level, I mean, we are our brother's keeper and all that, that's good, nice talk, good chat. But people respond, I think, more promptly and more effectively when they actually feel it, they sense it, they see the sense of urgency. And in fact, it is interesting now that one of the things that is happening in the Caribbean in a number of communities, particularly with the NGO groups, is that they're using the arts, they're using drama, they're using dance and so on to portray the direct impacts on people's lives and livelihoods. I mean, the impacts on health and education, food, nutrition. Um, and on, you know, so, so yes, when we speak of impacts on future generations and you know, what will happen in 2100 and so on, that's fairly nebulous to a lot of people. I think that we are moving in the Caribbean towards a more immediacy so that people are seeing that direct connection. I think that's an important point. And more and more um, governments are stressing the fact that climate change is not an environmental issue. It is not for fringe environmental groups and so on. It is an existential problem that impacts livelihoods and the country generally. Great. And um, yeah, coming quickly. <clears throat> so I think, you know, context matters. I think as soon as people start seeing that it's affecting them personally, obviously, I don't think that's a no brainer. But I think where we need to go, I would suggest that there are three areas. The one is more attention in the soft software. So the power issues, the social sciences, understanding that more, bringing more of those people to the table, etc the hardware, so how can we get technology actually enveloped and working with us for technological solutions, but then that's not enough. And the area that I'm now increasingly getting more and more interested in is what is called the heart, you know, H-E-A-R-T, where, because I think people are starting to realize, and I think COVID actually really exposed this, that, you know, it's the nursing staff, it's the people that we ignored in the health system, that we're becoming the carers. Um, and so there's quite a lot of work now going on in trauma science around trauma and how trauma is affecting people, mental health. So many of the youth, we've spoken a lot about positive stories, but there are a lot of youth who are carrying huge trauma, mental issues, et cetera, et cetera. So I think going forward, we need to really be working in some of those areas, hard, soft, but also not forgetting this hardware. And I think we're starting to see people starting to do more on the cognitive space, um, et cetera. So I think as we start growing that, I think you'll start getting more of that resonance of, of really what it means to be a human being and what Gina was talking about, the well-being economy and not just the GDP economy. <laughs> Thanks. Maybe just um, two points. One is I think there needs to be more focus on understanding collaboration and partnerships. Um, I don't think there's been enough of that and there's not enough sort of funding to support that. There's not enough energy to support that. And we really need to have that as a focus, these new partnerships. And I'm including the private sector, government, civil society. And what's been interesting is both COVID and the drought brought some of these different communities together in Cape Town. And we saw this uh, collaboration and participation, which was really important. And then the other thing is around innovation and really supporting innovation. So government systems have tended to support sort of services and one way of thinking. And now we're seeing a lot more focus on design, innovation, those stories um, and that um, people have spoken about now. And there are exciting things happening across. If you take a much more kind of holistic view that doesn't think in silos, you can see design and innovation that really have potential to solve some of these problems. So how do we then come in and support these and enable scaling up? And that scaling up is pretty challenging often, but really needs um, to have more attention, I think, because livelihoods can be at the center of that and one can have innovations that really support better lives and livelihoods um, if we can do that well. Thank you. Thank um, you. I'm sorry, Leonard. Sorry, I think Leonard, sorry, sure. um, I think Leonard hand is up. And yes, then I that, have a question also. Yes. Um, might I ask um, Gina a follow-up question to that? I'm curious, Gina, as to 
what is your perception of the receptiveness or how engaged have, has been the large business sector with the youth program that you shared with us, as opposed to small businesses? And because I, I, the, the, there is a difference in the Caribbean, generally that I would say is occurring. And I, I'm curious as to what is happening in South Africa in terms of the receptiveness and contribution and engagement of the larger business sector as opposed to small businesses. Thanks. So, I mean, it's hard for me to say in detail, but from my experience, I haven't seen a lot of interest from the large sector in the program. What is more interesting is certain businesses will be interested in the youth for certain aspects. So um, there might be a sector that's trying to bring in employment and then they want to engage with the youth. Um, there are some large businesses who want to support innovation and youthful ideas, but you see them more as kind of outliers rather than a sense that large business is interested in that. But maybe Colleen's got a different experience. Um, yeah, I think what Gina said is, is, is really relevant. And what we've noticed is we have large business organizations in South Africa. Um, you know, they form their own big networks like the business um, committees, et cetera, et cetera. And they have tried, they've reached out to you. So they bring them again to the table. But I think the problem is that they, <laughs> it becomes tokenistic. So often the youth are seated at the table, but the, the real value of what the youth can actually bring. Um, but I think that is starting to change. Um, but I have heard comments that, you know, oh, it just takes so long. These processes take so long. We need instant solutions. You know, the economy is moving up and down as we speak, et cetera, et cetera. So I think from the, the COP in Glasgow, I think there's a big effort now to get the youth and big business engaged in big organizational structures. But I agree with Gina on the ground, so to speak, there are a couple of philanthropies who've seen the light in a way and starting to really fund and make money, et cetera, available. But um, yeah, uh, it's not an overwhelming reach out to youth, but I think it's coming, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Cynthia. Um, I'm gonna change the direction a little bit. Um, because um, all of the authors have, uh, uh, all of the lecturers today um, had have been involved in IPCC probably more times than they actually wanted to be. <laughs> and here's my question. Do, what, do we still need it? Uh, you know, should we recreate it? In a way, listening to these wonderful talks today, um, you know, maybe we need something new. Uh, you know, these exercises going on and on and the arguments with the governments. And it's just kind of like, it seems like a broken record. The uh, IP, I think the IPCC scientists are kind of getting more shrill and, you know, sort of more, you know, on the other, you know, like the whole thing seems to maybe be outliving its shelf life. What do you think? I'm being provocative. <laughs> Yes, you are, Cynthia. You're very <laughs> provocative. Interestingly enough, only yesterday I was reading the summary of a webinar that Elan Kelman provided. And he was dealing with the precise subject that you just raised. Has the IPCC outlived its usefulness? And the, 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 I don't know whether you saw that article, but the, the oh. consensus is that the IPCC filled a very important niche, has done a wonderful job, but essentially as the IPCC now provides more corroborating evidence, so to speak, rather than um, newness, as the way they put it, maybe the IPCC needs to reinvent itself. I, I, I don't come down one side or the other yet myself because I'm, I'm still thinking about it. I had only seen it yesterday. And it is, I'm glad you raised it because this is quite provocative. Um, a colleague of mine who maybe worked together on small island states chapters for the um, IPCC over four assessments. And he and I have raised it um, on a couple of occasions. Should the IPCC be more um, thinking strategically about providing directions for the global research community to go in? Or should the IPCC step back and look at the gaps 
that the IPCC itself over the assessments, the six assessments, has actually identified. It's interesting because let me tell you, I'm ashamed to, I'm ashamed to say that Roger and I got about 25% in writing a paper on that subject about the gaps that have not been filled. And that assessment after assessment, the IPCC returns and identifies more gaps that need to be filled. But a lot of the gaps, if you go back to the second assessment report and the TAR, there's some gaps which are in a sense being repeated in different guises in subsequent assessments, which need some attention. And maybe the IPCC could begin, I'm not saying that's what the only thing they should be doing, but I think there, there's a suite of things that could perhaps be looked at very strategically. Finding the gaps and sort of nudging the research community into trying to plug those gaps may be one of those things that it can be. Wonderful. Thoughts, Gina or, or Colleen? Um, so, <laughs> Yeah, having been involved in the IPCC, I mean, I think the IPCC obviously has done an amazing set of work and is really kind of the bastion of evidence-based science. But I'm recently now, I think I was telling you at the outset of this today, Cynthia, I've been very fortunate to be invited into the transformations work of the IPBES, the Biodiversity Assessment. And it's being led by Karen O'Brien, Arun Agrawal and others. And What's really interesting is that they've gone in a way, the same idea, but it's much, much more condensed. So chapters have got like 8,000 words. So you can't do these door stoppers, you know. <laughs> Sometimes I use the IPCC, I need to say tongue in cheek when the storms come through, when the doors stop banging, I quickly grab the big IPCC <laughs> to stop. No, but I'm, I'm saying this tongue in cheek, obviously. But the, the whole point is that um, writing these much shorter synthetic pieces, but I do think we do need space for that. The other thing, um, but it's going to be interesting to see if the transformations work is going to be able to do that because the topic is so involved. How do you bring it into only such a short space? But the other thing is, and I don't know if um, Gina feels the same and others are, are noticing this, but it seems as if because the window is closing, people are now starting to tussle with, and I tussle with it myself, the role of activism, action, and evidence-based science. And I think that's a big tension now. Um, you know, the work that Gina and I shared with you today is action coming from communities who have legitimate voice. How does that now get into the IPCC? It has to filter through an academic process. Gray literature has always been a problem. So how do we bring, find a process that can actually legitimize some of these voices as well into the process? And so that's an interesting thing that the IPBES have started, you know, with local indigenous knowledge holders, and now they're reaching out to practitioners and everything. So it's a very interesting question. I still think there is a place for the IPCC, but I think it's going to almost by virtue of the, of the civic society moving is going to almost force, in a way, the tweaks that we need. Right. Tina, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I feel quite conflicted because I think just coming out of this latest IPCC report and I was on the cities and settlements chapter, I really see this amazing rich, I mean, the amount of literature in this field is so massive that it's very hard for one person to kind of go through it all. So I think the chapter does an amazing job of reviewing what is in the literature. But as Colleen said, that is what is in the literature, which is only one portion because there's so much action stuff that is happening. And that's what we also need to share. So I think there are other great examples around of where more of this applied stuff is being reviewed and shared. And it's these community of practices that I think are so important where we can share some of these lessons um, and the insights into what is working that the IPCC is quite um, dense and so hard to get across some of those messages and some people are just not going to engage. So how do we share these messages um, in a way that is accessible right very uh, good Leonard, Cynthia, I think you... I have a, just one quick comment on that sure uh, the idea about the IPC inventing itself to be more forward-looking rather than just simply analyzing and assessing what's happened in the past and particularly in literature that certainly seems like seems like a good idea but I think the value of continuing the IPCC is that when the reports come out, they get a tremendous amount of attention from the media. And mm -hmm. I can't see anything else replacing it. 
You know, uh, the American Meteorological Society produces these wonderful reports on the state of the climate system each year. They are amazing, they're detailed. Nobody ever hears about them outside the scientific community. The IPCC is set up with all the publicity organs to make a big impact. You know, something somebody said that if something is not visible, it's like it's not happening. And this is a way to get a big impact. Improving it, reinventing, yes. But I, I still like the idea that there's a marker that, that tells people periodically, this is what's happening, look out. Great, wonderful. Leonard, are we going to be losing you, I think, in a few minutes? Yes. Do you need um, to top off? Yeah. So we want to yeah. thank you so much. And just uh, you, you, uh, you have a, a word, and then we'll do a brief wrap up. A final comment. Um, just, I, I agree with David that the IPCC sort of makes the information public and is sort of in everybody's face. And they've been doing a good job of that. And I, I, I really would like to see, I wouldn't like to see that mechanism replaced. And I agree with David on that, that's important. Um, if we truly believe that the IPCC has to change TAC, we'd have to begin finding some way of communicating this to the governments. Remember the IPCC did not give birth to itself. It was formed by the governments at plenaries, various plenaries. And I think that in a plenary, we have to be behind the scenes somehow mobilizing our governments and other colleagues who go to the IPCC plenary meetings. We as scientists don't go. We're given our marching orders for the assessments. And I think if we truly believe there's some things that need to change, we've got to convince our governments who go, only God knows. But I think this discussion needs to take place before there's a discussion, before there's an agreement on the seventh assessment. And I think that maybe um, one of the things that you, Cynthia, could, could do well is to get together with Martin again and... Um, so set up some forum inviting ideas that we could communicate to the IPCC secretariat to raise <laughs> as the, the thinking forward. But I was saying that tongue in cheek. But before I go. <laughs> Thank you for it. Well, wow. it's, a, it's a really fun idea. We'll see. And Martin is off camping right now. We'll see when he comes <laughs> back from his camping before trip. I go, before I go, I think that I just want to point out that the, the, in terms of adaptation in the Caribbean now, the focus continues to be on that water agriculture health nexus. I mean, that remains really critical. Um, the, with increasing aridity, droughts becoming longer and more intense, it's really problematic. So that water agricultural nexus is important. Another area where the, that the Caribbean is looking at, and because they're very concerned about it, is the question of accessing more precise guidance on how to prioritize adaptation options. Given scarce resources, um, you know, what is going to be the timing of impacts? We have some projected timings um, with, you know, with quite a lot of uncertainty and so on. So you know, the governments are actually crying out for a little bit more precision in timing of those impacts, likely timing, so that they can better respond and prioritize the little resources that they have, okay? And that's Wonderful. where I have to give you colleagues. Thanks a lot again. And I really enjoy this. Thank you Bye so on. much. Thank you, Leonard. It was great to, to, to share this time with you. Thank you. Thank you much. Bye-bye, all. Wonderful. I think then, Jen, we have a few wrap-up slides, I think. Yes, and let me get those up. To... Great. So first of all, the webinar recordings will be available. It usually takes about a week or so to get them posted, uh, but they're all there. So all of this and this wonderful discussion will be um, the lectures um, uh, will will be available. This is also one of the great things um, um, about, uh, <laughs> about te our technology. Um, and finally, 
uh, I just wanted to, as they wrap up, here's the book again. Uh, for those of you interested in getting it, there's a discount go code. Uh, Colleen, uh, we will make sure you get your book. I promise somehow, if, even if it's we're going to put it in somebody's suitcase, once people can travel again from COVID. Um, but what I want to do is, and here again, this is for the, um, David went over these, that, that is uh, all the rich topics. But what I want to do to wrap up this webinar is read the very last thing in the book. I don't know if you noticed this, you two, because you actually haven't, because yeah, Gina just got hers and Colleen hasn't seen it. But on page 680, we say, we end with the words of our colleagues, Colleen Vogel and Gina Zierwogel. And this is the quote from your, from your contribution, from your lecture. At the time of writing this brief piece, the surreal COVID-19 virus is stalking humanity and it still is today. Many countries are in lockdown. This is starting again right now with our fourth wave. It's happening right here in New York. The compound and concatenating risks that such a virus adds to the suite of other risks, not least climate change and climate variability, remain pressing and very urgent. The need for swift, generative, and proactive actions rather than reactive, passive responses is being highlighted hourly. So thank you for those those just Im important words um, that that end the work and end this webinar. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks, um, and um, uh, looking forward to it. Everyone, just watch your emails, and you'll find out who who are going to be the next speakers. Thanks very thank very you. very much. Cheers, thank guys. You. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Wonderful to see you. Bye.